July the 24th, Second Chronicles 11, 1 through 13, 22. Upon arrival at Jerusalem, Rehoboam mobilized the armies of Judah and Benjamin, 180,000 strong, and declared war against the rest of Israel in an attempt to reunite the kingdom. But the Lord told Shemaiah the prophet, Go and say to King Rehoboam of Judah, Solomon's son, and to the people of Judah and of Benjamin. For the Lord says, Do not fight against your brothers. Go home, for I am behind their rebellion. So they obeyed the Lord and refused to fight against Jeroboam. Rehoboam stayed in Jerusalem and fortified these cities of Judah with walls and gates to protect himself. Bethlehem, Etam, Tekoa, Bethzer, Soko, Adullam, Gath, Marisha, Ziph, Adoraim, Lachish, Azekah, Zorah, Aijalon, and Hebron. He also rebuilt and strengthened the forts and manned them with companies of soldiers under their officers and stored them with food, olive oil, and wine. Shields and spears were placed in armories in every city as a further safety measure, for only Judah and Benjamin remained loyal to him. However, the priests and Levites from the other tribes now abandoned their homes and moved to Judah and Jerusalem, for King Jeroboam had fired them, telling them to stop being priests of the Lord. He had appointed other priests instead, who encouraged the people to worship idols instead of God, and to sacrifice to carve statues of goats and calves, which he placed on the hills. Laman, too, from all over Israel, began moving to Jerusalem, where they could freely worship the Lord God of their fathers and sacrifice to him. This strengthened the kingdom of Judah, so King Rehoboam survived for three years without difficulty. For during those years, there was an earnest effort to obey the Lord, as King David and King Solomon had done. Rehoboam married his cousin, Mahalath. She was the daughter of David's son, Jeremiah, and Abihail, the daughter of David's brother, Eliab. Three sons were born from this marriage, Jeush, Shemariah, and Zahab. Later, he married Maacah, the daughter of Absalom. The children she bore him were Abijah, Atei, Ziza, and Shilomith. He loved Maacah more than any of his other wives and concubines. He had 18 wives and 60 concubines, with 28 sons and 60 daughters. Maacah's son, Abijah, was his favorite, and he intended to make him the next king. He very wisely scattered his other sons in the fortified cities throughout the land of Judah and Benjamin, and gave them large allowances and arranged for them to have several wives apiece. But just when Rehoboam was at the height of his popularity and power, he abandoned the Lord, and the people followed him in this sin. As a result, King Shishak of Egypt attacked Jerusalem in the fifth year of King Rehoboam's reign. With 1,200 chariots, 60,000 cavalrymen, an unnumbered host of infantrymen, Egyptians, Libyans, Sukkim, and Ethiopians. He quickly conquered Judah's fortified cities and soon arrived at Jerusalem. The prophet Shemaiah now met with Rehoboam and the Judean leaders from every part of the nation. They had fled to Jerusalem for safety and told them, The Lord says, You have forsaken me, so I have forsaken you and abandoned you to Shishak. Then the king and the leaders of Israel confessed their sins and exclaimed, The Lord is right in doing this to us. And when the Lord saw them humble themselves, he sent Shemaiah to tell them, Because you have humbled yourselves, I will not completely destroy you. Some will escape. I will not use Shishak to pour out my anger upon Jerusalem, but you must pay annual tribute to him. Then you will realize how much better it is to serve me than to serve him. So King Shishak of Egypt conquered Jerusalem and took away all the treasures of the temple and of the palace, also all of Solomon's gold shields. King Rehoboam replaced them with bronze shields committed them to the care of the captain of his bodyguard. Whenever the king went to the temple, the guards would carry them, and afterwards return them to the armory. When the king humbled himself, the Lord's anger was turned aside, and he didn't send total destruction. In fact, even after Shishak's invasion, the economy of Judah remained strong. King Rehoboam reigned 17 years in Jerusalem, the city God had chosen as his residence, after considering all the other cities of Israel. He had become king at the age of 41, and his mother's name was Naamah, the Ammonitess. But he was an evil king, for he never did decide really to please the Lord. The complete biography of Rehoboam is recorded in the histories written by Shemaiah the prophet and by Iddo the seer, and in the genealogical register. There were continual wars between Rehoboam and Jeroboam. When Rehoboam died, he was buried in Jerusalem, and his son Abijah became the new king. Abijah became the new king of Judah in Jerusalem in the 18th year of the reign of King Jeroboam of Israel. He lasted three years. His mother's name was Micaiah, daughter of Uriel, of Gibeah. Early in his reign, war broke out between Judah and Israel. Judah, 
led by King Abijah, fielded 400,000 seasoned warriors against twice as many Israeli troops. Strong, courageous men, led by King Jeroboam. When the army of Judah arrived at Mount Zemaraim in the hill country of Ephraim, King Abijah shouted to King Jeroboam and the Israeli army, Listen! Don't you realize that the Lord God of Israel swore that David's descendants would always be the kings of Israel? Your king, Jeroboam, is a mere servant of David's son and was a traitor to his master. Then a whole gang of worthless rebels joined him, defying Solomon's son, Rehoboam, for he was young and frightened and couldn't stand up to them. Do you really think you can defeat the kingdom of the Lord that is led by a descendant of David? Your army is twice as large as mine, but you are cursed with those gold calves you had with you that Jeroboam made for you. He calls them your gods. And you have driven away the priests of the Lord and the Levites and have appointed heathen priests instead, just like the people of other lands. You accept as priests anybody who comes along with a young bullock and seven rams for consecration. Anyone at all can be a priest of these no gods of yours. But as for us, the Lord is our God, and we have not forsaken him. Only the descendants of Aaron are our priests, and the Levites alone may help them in their work. They burn sacrifices to the Lord every morning and evening, burnt offerings and sweet incense, and they place the bread of the presence upon the holy table. The golden lampstand is lighted every night, for we are careful to follow the instructions of the Lord our God. But you have forsaken him. So you see, God is with us. He is our leader. His priests, trumpeting as they go, will lead us into battle against you. O oh, people of Israel, do not fight against the Lord God of your fathers, for you will not succeed. Meanwhile, Jeroboam had secretly sent part of his army around behind the men of Judah to ambush them. So Judah was surrounded, with the enemy before and behind them. Then they cried out to the Lord for mercy, and the priests blew the trumpets. The men of Judah began to shout, and as they shouted, God used King Abijah and the men of Judah to turn the tide of battle against King Jeroboam and the army of Israel. And they slaughtered 500,000 elite troops of Israel that day. So Judah, depending upon the Lord God of their fathers, defeated Israel and chased King Jeroboam's troops and captured some of his cities, Bethel, Jeshana, Ephron, and their suburbs. King Jeroboam of Israel never regained his power during Abijah's lifetime, and eventually the Lord struck him and he died. Meanwhile, King Abijah of Judah became very strong. He married 14 wives and had 22 sons and 16 daughters. His complete biography and speeches are recorded in the prophet Iddo's History of Judah. Romans 8, 24 through 39. We are saved by trusting. And trusting means looking forward to getting something we don't yet have. For a man who already has something doesn't need to hope and trust that he will get it. But if we must keep trusting God for something that hasn't happened yet, it teaches us to wait patiently and confidently. And in the same way, by our faith, the Holy Spirit helps us with our daily problems and in our praying. For we don't even know what we should pray for, nor how to pray as we should. But the Holy Spirit prays for us with such feeling that it cannot be expressed in words. And the Father who knows all hearts knows, of course, what the Spirit is saying as he pleads for us in harmony with God's own will. And we know that all that happens to us is working for our good if we love God and are fitting into his plans. For from the very beginning, God decided that those who came to him, and all along he knew who would, should become like his son, so that his son would be the first with many brothers. And having chosen us, he called us to come to him. And when we came, he declared us not guilty, filled us with Christ's goodness, gave us right standing with himself, and promised us his glory. What can we ever say to such wonderful things as these? If God is on our side, who can ever be against us? Since he did not spare even his own son for us, but gave him up for us all, won't he also surely give us everything else? Who dares accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? Will God? No. He is the one who has forgiven us and given us right standing with himself. Who then will condemn us? Will Christ? No. For he is the one who died for us and came back to life again for us and is sitting at the place of highest honor next to God, pleading for us there in heaven. Who then can ever keep Christ's love from us? When we have trouble or calamity, when we are hunted down or destroyed, 
Is it because he doesn't love us anymore? And if we are hungry or penniless or in danger or threatened with death, has God deserted us? No. For the scriptures tell us that for his sake, we must be ready to face death at every moment of the day. We are like sheep awaiting slaughter. But despite all this, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ, who loved us enough to die for us. For I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from his love. Death can, and life can. The angels won't, and all the powers of hell itself cannot keep God's love away. Our fears for today, our worries about tomorrow, or where we are high above the sky or in the deepest ocean, nothing will ever be able to separate us from the love of God demonstrated by our Lord Jesus Christ when he died. Proverbs for today, 19, 27 through 29. Stop listening to teaching that contradicts what you know is right. A worthless witness cares nothing for truth. He enjoys his sinning too much. Mockers and rebels shall be severely punished. 